So good to be here. Yes. Amen. To hear the word of the Lord, to gather together, assembly of the saints, hear the word of the Lord, open our hearts to him, be ready for a, an unbashful obedience. To come into that place where we say, I'm going to have an unbashful obedience. Let's ask for the Lord's blessing. Father in heaven, we thank you. Once again, gathering together. We pray for your presence. We pray that your purpose would have its way in our hearts, minds, and souls as we go through the Word of God. As your Word says, Lord, it's a light to our path. Father in heaven, that you would be the one to direct us, to guide us, and that we would place our full trust in the living God. In the name of Jesus Christ and for the glory of God. Amen. Amen. All right, as you well know, as you can see, we are tonight on Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Now, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, is actually, as you know, and as you can see, a continuance of verse 1. It is two powerful statements being made. They've separated into verse 1 and 2, but it really is and should be fully together. But we're looking tonight at chapter 12, verse 2, when he says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen? Amen. Now, if you remember in verse 1, there were three, let us, let us, let us. Do you remember? Let us, that therefore, remember, therefore, it started off, therefore, and said, let us lay aside that weight. Let us lay that aside. Again, let us put aside that, that sin that so easily ensnares us. Remember? And then let us run our course. In other words, as you've heard me say in time past, when you have let us, let us, let us, you have a great salad. In this, coming together and seeing it all coming together, let us, let us, let us. This is probably the only lettuce I've ever devoured and like. Wow. <laughs> now you can say amen. amen. Okay. <laughs> they belong together as one forceful statement. Let us, let us, let us. The revelation of truth coming alive in us is to encourage. Remember Hebrews chapter, chapter, the whole book of Hebrews, but is designed to uh, encourage to empower, uh, to edify, to build up, edify, to build up, to encourage you. Encourage meaning to give you courage. Many times today you'll find people oftentimes just, I just want to encourage you and I just want to encourage you. And how many so-called words are on Facebook today and, and all other kinds of social media to encourage you. And I just want to encourage you. And oftentimes today encouragement is flattery. It's just to make you feel better about yourself. Encouragement is to give you Courage. courage. Courage of faith. Courage to live. Courage to pursue. Courage to stand. Courage to speak. I'm here to encourage you. Well, the book of Hebrews was written to what? Encourage you. And also all those warnings to also warn you. Remember how many warnings we've already gone through in the book of Hebrews. It keeps warning us. It's to inspire us, to ignite, uh, to instruct, to bring us to that place where you're ignited, inspired, and instructed that you're ready to pursue. You're ready to go after the promises of God. You're ready to, to, to link with the cloud of witnesses. You're ready to put your mind on the Lord. You're, you're now filled with faith. Your faith is ignited. I want the Lord. And you're ready to endure the trial of this life. That's what we're talking about here. Let us lay aside that old sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us lay aside that weight that holds us down and hinders us. And let us get rid of that stuff, that old mind. That let us instead, let us run that race with endurance. And now he starts off with what? Looking unto Jesus. In other words, there is direction and there is destination. Looking unto Jesus is there is direction and there is destination. You and I, as believers, must understand that we are on a path, and a path that has direction. Remember Pilgrim's Progress? Path? And what was the admonishment, the encouragement? What was it? Stay on the path. Has the, that was written when? 
1,500 years after the Hebrews was written, 500 years, 600 years, we find ourselves sitting here, and I'm referencing this man, John, I'm referencing his book. To do what? So, such a simple message. What's the message? Stay on the path. But it's easy to go off the path when you don't have your looking unto Jesus settled in your soul. Because it's easy to all of a sudden look here, look there, hear that word, right? Isn't that what they did uh, through Pilgrim's Progress? Look here, look there, hear that word, hear that, think of this. Someone said that, you said that. Boy, I could do that. I could say here. Try this path. Try that way. Rather than looking unto Jesus. Every fault, hear me now, every fault that goes on in your life, in my life, every fault that goes on in the church, everything that goes on with carnal nature and any destruction and division that takes place, any rebellion, rebellion, any defiance that takes place in the church, in our lives, in your family, is because someone has taken their eyes off of Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Let's put the fault where it lies. It's in us. Well, you don't know my story, and there you are again. Well, it's been difficult, and I've always had, there it is again. The unbelief at work. Well, I'm, no, I believe, nope, that's unbelief. That is unbelief at work. It's been difficult, it's been hard, I've got troubles, I feel weak, I've, I pull back, I'm intimidated. All that is just our excuses and explanations, because we have not done what we're called to do, which is what? Right here. Looking unto Jesus. If we, now ask yourself, if we fully and completely always did verse 1 and 2, how many problems in your life, my life, family, and church would go away? That even though the problems may be there, they're no longer holding say and sway over your mind, your heart, and your soul. Troubles and trials will always come. Jesus promised it. Afflictions will surely come against you. But in this you will find that you will be settled in your soul because three words have overtaken you. Looking unto Jesus. That's where the thankfulness comes in. That's where humility settles in your soul. That's when contentment comes into your life. That's where trust and hope overtake you. That's where your mind calms down. That's when your thinking becomes clear. That's when your confidence comes forth and it's rooted in faith. And all of a sudden you just find yourself just going... <sighs> I was talking to a fellow today for an hour on the phone. And he's dealing with the unrest in his heart and unrest in the world and all the things that are taking place in family and, and what he should do and where he's going and, and, uh, and good talk. But in it all, I left him with these powerful two words. And you've heard me say them over 15 years. Calm down. Calm down. <laughs> See, you even know. I don't even have to. <laughs> calm down. How do you calm down? How do, oh, um, <laughs> let's not go there. It is looking unto Jesus. That's the answer. It is coming to that place where you and I realize that he is the captain of salvation. Remember Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10 when he said the captain of salvation. He's in charge, the commander that met Joshua with Flowers in his hand for Joshua and for all the Israelites. <laughs> Bouquet of flowers. Welcome. Welcome, Josh. So good to have you here. Look what I've done for you. Just come on in and enjoy your life. Love, love, love. And he's got what in his hand? A sword. Not flowers. Not the local lilies. Not the buttercups that come up. Not a little handful of this or that. Not a meal prepared for him. War. Battle. You're in a battle. And he's called the captain of salvation. Meaning, why would he say captain? Why isn't it nurse? Caretaker. Captain. That's battle talk, is it not? Captain of salvation. He's battling for your soul. He's battling, again, bringing all enemies under the feet of Christ. He's battling, letting life and liberty have its way. And you and I just simply yield to his victory. Yield to his conquering power. Yield to his rule. Yield to his Godhead. Yield to his body. Yield to his purity. Yield to his humility. We yield to his faith. 
looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher, we yield to his faith. That's where life and liberty is. We yield to his faith. We yield to his faith. In other words, believe God. Come on now. Believe God. <laughs> it's, he's made it so easy for us. We make it so hard because we get our eyes off of Jesus, off salvation, off the kingdom, off his divine nature, off of what the Holy Spirit is doing in our life, and we want it this way, and we want it that way, and how come he's not take care of this, and I don't trust him with that, and I, how come it can't be, and I just want, and I just want, and it seems to me, and all of these uh, thoughts of unbelief come out of our words and discontent and thankfulness, thanklessness. And we look at what we don't have versus what we do have. And you could lose everything, even your last breath and even your life. And what do you have? Jesus. That's what it comes down to. We don't live with peripheral living. We're not looking into Jesus using peripheral, peripheral sight. We're not looking for him this way, nor are we walking in this world always looking at everything around us with fear, fret, or lust and attraction for other things. That's what leads us astray because we're no longer looking unto Jesus. We're now looking. Well, no, I've got my, I'm looking. But we're actually always looking for, as a matter of fact, I used to play basketball and we were always taught to use our peripheral vision, right? Don't always look where you're passing the ball. Don't just look and say, hey, Chris, you ready? Ready? There's all the five defenders out there, yes? In other words, it's this way, right? Using peripheral. But when you're in the Christian walk, you are not Jesus. It is Jesus and no peripheral. You trust him. He's got your flanks. He's got your rear guard. He's the one who's got you, hold you, and is bringing you home. And you fully put your trust in him, and you dare not take your gaze off him. He's got your gaze. He's got your eyes. He's got your look. You are looking unto him. I remember that Kara caught my look. Gawking in at 20, 21 years old into a CVS store here in Hooksett, and in comes bopping behind the counter as a gal with bright eyes. Right. There I was, and what? Bing. <laughs> Bing. Right? Caught my eye. Right? And wherever I look, that's where I'm going. <laughs> right? It's the same way. Christ caught my heart. He caught my attention. He caught my attraction. Looking unto Jesus is not just a matter of, of some destination. It says he's got my attraction. He's got my attention. He's got where I'm going. And wherever I look, that's where I step. And wherever I step, that's where I'm going. And that's what you want in life. He's got your eyes fixed on him for direction and destination. I'm going to the heavenly city where Christ is king. I'm going to the temple. I'm going to New Jerusalem. I have a destination. I have a direction. I have a path. I have a captain of the salvation. And we're looking into Jesus and when that happens all other problems seem to grow strangely dim. We used to sing that song and I still love it today and once in a while we'll sing it and I only know the piece but when you look into his glorious face things of this world grow strangely dim. That's so true. It happened in my life. I used to be a man of, of, of sales and money and investments and seeking to make that next sale and looking to always have more. And when you have more, you want some more. And when you have finally some more, you want a bit more. And then when you have the bit more, just another bit more. But all of a sudden, he captures you. And all, of us, all you care about is, I want to know truth. I want to know the truth, and I want truth alive in me. I want truth alive in my family. I want truth. He's got your gaze. He's got your focus. He's got your heart. He's got your attention. But in this, you have to ask yourself, and I have to ask myself, what does have my attention? And where does my attraction lie? That's what we always have. Remember Paul said to the church, examine yourselves. That's what we're failing oftentimes to do. Or we examine ourselves, and then we tell ourselves stories. And then we just excuse it. Well, God knows my heart. And we excuse all our bad behavior, assuming his salvation. But your eye gate, 
that's what counts. Looking unto Jesus, the soul, the eyes of your soul, where are they pointed? Who has that, that eye gate? Well, in this you look around this world and say, where are people paying attention to? Where are they looking? Where's, where are your friends? Where are you? Where am I? Where are we looking unto? What is our unto? Looking unto Jesus, where is the world looking unto? Everybody's looking for something, someone. What, what does the drunk look for? The drunk is always looking for the next drink. Yeah? yeah? The drunk looks for the next drink. He looks at that drink. As a matter of fact, a recovering alcoholic will oftentimes do what with that drink that passes before him? It captures all his attention. How can he overcome? Looking unto Jesus. How, what does the addict look for? Looks for the drug. What does the fearful look at? The fearful looks at the problem. The depressed always looks at the issues. The womanizer always looks at all the gals. The prostitute looks for the client. The adulterer looks for the pleasure. The thief looks for the free goods. The bully looks to be exalted in others' eyes. The businessman looks for the deal. The investor looks for the profit. The salesman looks for the sale. Where's, where's your look? Where's my look? Where should our look be? All right, I'm a believer. Where should the believer's eyes be? Looking unto Jesus. Believers, when they're believing, are looking unto Jesus. And they put their trust in Him. They put their hope in Him. He has their attraction. He has their attention. He has their trust. He has their, he, they seek to pl have pleasure in Him. They seek to have joy in Him. They seek to have peace in Him. They're looking only unto Jesus. He must be your look. He has your eye gate. The hook is in the look. The hook is in the look. The devil will cast his hook before you trying to bring your look to him and to his woman and to his ways and to his harlot and to his world. But in this you must be focused on Jesus. Looking unto him. But remember verse 1. What can so easily ensnare us? The sin that so easily ensnares us. What can weight us down where it becomes a chore and a burden and a hassle and a monotony and a frustration and an aggravation? That weight, that thing, that thing we allow to drag us down. But let us run our race with endurance and our destination, our direction, our fuel is looking unto Jesus. If you catch these three words, oftentimes people will use them on a t all the time and just throw it around on a, on a Facebook post, some social post, or tell each other looking unto Jesus. But this is the answer. But it cannot be the answer for you if we do not do verse 1. If we do not do verse 1, we will struggle with verse 2. And you cannot do verse 2 unless you have first done verse 1. You have to get rid of the old man in order to put on the new man. Yes? Colossians talks about putting on the new man, but first says what? Take off the old man. Mortify those members. Ephesians says the same thing, does it not? It says put on the new man, but before it says put on the new man, put off the old man. Before you take off the, put on the new garment, take off the old garment. It's the work of the Lord. As a matter of fact, looking at Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 4, he says this. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. And here it is. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God when Christ who is our life appears then you also will appear with him in glory set your mind seek those things remember I preached that sermon uh, a few years ago on six words for life and living set your mind on things above set your mind on things above that's six words Six words that will change your life. Six words that will bring liberty into your life. But put it now with Hebrews chapter 12, 1 and 2. Let us lay aside that sin. Let us lay aside that weight. Let us run our race with endurance. And now three words looking unto Jesus. Amen? Amen. 
This is the life of repentance. This is laying aside and turning away from sin, from weight that bears us down. This is the life of repentance. Just as when the people called out to Peter, what shall we do? What did he say? Repent. The message hasn't changed. The church has changed the message, softening it, making it more lukewarm and palatable for people, making it sweeten it in some way. Talk about the prosperity of all that you can have because God loves you and wants to bless you with houses and cars and, and all kinds of retirement programs and health. And, so, and if you don't have that, it's because your faith is lousy. So you feel lousy all the time because you don't have all those things because your faith is not strong enough. So you keep trying to get more faith and you get more faith by giving more. It's crazy. Rather than just make it real simple, looking unto Jesus. Surrender all. Surrender all. all. Surrender your affections, your rule, your godlike behavior. Surrender your aggravation and your frustrations and all the other Asians that are stealing your, like a thief and bringing in uh, your joy and bringing uh, in anxiety and depression, despondency and carnal ways and making excuses and associating with those who are not believers just so you can have some comfort in your life and feel somewhat righteous. Instead, surrender everything. Looking unto Jesus. Put off the old and come into the new. As a matter of fact, as Colossians 3, chapter 1 through 4, then it immediately falls into and starts going into put off the old man, put on the new man. Read Colossians number th chapter 3. Go beyond verse 4 and it starts talking about put off and put on. Put off and put on. Put off that old, put on the new. It hasn't changed. To look unto Jesus and have His joy, His peace, His power, His purpose. To have His promises coming alive in us. We must lay aside that old sin. Lay aside that old weight. Lay aside that design of our mind. Lay aside all those plans. Lay aside all those designs. All those things that we're thinking about. All those relationships that we want to hang on to. Give them up unto the Lord and let them be what He makes them to be. Because you're trusting Him. That's what we do. Because we do not walk according to what we see. Amen? God has made all things in this world for your eye gate to see. But faith sees the only, faith is the only thing that can see beyond this world. Faith sees the promises of God. Faith sees the purposes of God. Faith sees all the things of God. Faith sees the very personhood of who He is. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 7 through 9. For we walk by faith, not by sight. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Let, it, let it be so. But how easy it is to get our eyes off of that. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident. Are you confident tonight? Confident in the faith. Yes. Well pleased. Rather to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. Therefore, Underlined it here from me, not in the Bible. We make it our aim. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to do what? To be well-pleasing to Him. Amen. That you and I, as believers with faith alive in our hearts, looking unto Jesus, we want to be a pleasure to Him, to bring no grief to the Holy Spirit. Does He not warn us and tell us to not bring grief to the Holy Spirit? I know I've brought grief to the Holy Spirit. Thoughts. Heart, intents, plans. And you have to shake yourself out of it. And you, oh Lord. Then you bring grief to Him. Have you brought grief to Him? When? Why keep doing that? Because you want to be well pleasing. Because you're going to see Him and give an account for all things. And you want to aim to please. Remember that sermon that I preached? Aim to please. Aim to please. Our life is to aim to please the living God. The Holy Spirit who has set up home in your heart and is preparing you for the kingdom, preparing the kingdom for you for the big welcome home because this is not your home as exemplified in Abraham. So therefore we're living unto the Lord. We're looking unto the Lord and we're pursuing the living God and the believer looks unto the Lord. We don't look for the drink. We don't look to womanize. We don't look for stealing. We don't look for deception. And we don't design plans to try to make it all better for us around here. Instead, we look unto Jesus. We're not those that are given to the things of this world. Jesus said to, to, to keep your eyes on Him, on the Holy Spirit, on God the Father, on the kingdom. He is from above. We, the, whole, the human nature is from beneath. Keep your eyes on Him. Seek those things which are above, as Paul said. That's what we're doing. 
Faith is exemplified in Christ. So therefore we die daily. He exemplified faith. We die daily. Separate from the world. Separate from devils. Separate, separate from all things natural. Separate from our own selfish rule and our godlike behavior and, our, and our, uh, the evil ways in our heart. Our pride. Is, anybody else besides me deal with pride? Has dealt with? You know, pride. Pride is a thief. Pride is a thief. And we so easily empower it. Why? Because we're trying to hang on to our own affections, trying to hang on to our own sense of insecurities, trying to do it ourselves, trying to not let our insecurities be seen or known, trying to keep our inadequacies and inferiorities from being, from being exposed for what they really are, a shame for what people will think of us, and so we cower. Uh, cowering is unbelief at work. Pride covers up our inferiorities. Pride is the devil's answer to cover your insecurities and make you feel bold. It's the devil's answer. But instead you and I are open to the things of, of the Lord. We looking unto him and allowing his faith to be our faith. He's the author of it. He's from above. Yes? yes. It says this. He and his kingdom are not of this world. He says in John chapter 8 verse 23, he said to them, You are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Can you imagine somebody coming into your, and saying that? Like you've been looking for the, but all of a sudden here you are in Israel, you've been a Pharisee, you've been a scribe, you've been a teacher, you've been one of the, just a common person in the street. And here comes this man, and he says this, You are from beneath, I am from above. Picture yourself there hearing that for the first time. I'm the one who came down from heaven. Right? Hearing that. I am not of this world. Like, well then where'd you come from? <laughs> it was such a mystery. And he's revealing the mystery. More so, he revealed the mystery in my own heart. In your heart. He says in John chapter 18 verse 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. He's talking to Pilate here. He's towards the end of his, his ministry here on earth. He's now heading to Calvary. And he says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Remember the kingdoms of the world were offered to him by Satan? They were under his control and still are. Remember what John said? The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Satan gave them a, a, to Christ. Christ could have easily have just turned around and said, those aren't for you to give. He, but he recognized you have full authority. That these are under your hand. And Jesus here is saying that he and his kingdom are not of this world. Amen. So when we're looking unto Jesus, we're recognizing that we're looking for beyond this world. Yes? Faith sees beyond this world. It sees his promises. It sees his purpose. It sees, it sees his personhood. We're looking unto Jesus. Therefore, his people also are not of this world. Amen? You and I must recognize that his people are not of this world. He said in John chapter 17 verse 11, Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. He then says in John chapter 17, a few verses later, verse 14, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. In other words, he's not of the world, his kingdom's not of this world, and his people are not of this world. Therefore, to be his people, you must be born of his Holy Spirit and live a life as a soldier in this world or as a pilgrim. Hence, John Bunyan wrote, Pilgrim's Progress. How to make progress as a pilgrim in this world? Stay on the path. Look towards looking unto Jesus. Focused on. Want his life to 
come alive in you. He has your full attention. You're not looking to have one, world, one foot in this world and one foot hoping to fall into the kingdom when he comes and tell yourself, well, I'm sure it's okay. I, I think I'm still saved. Gee, I still speak in tongues. I guess I'm okay as we do whatever we want. I'm telling you that there is a life coming that is going to expose all the things of darkness in our, our hearts, our minds, and our souls. You want to purify yourselves just as he is pure. Is that not so? First, John, John wrote to the church and said, and whoever has this hope purifies. purifies himself just as he is pure. To what measure, to what standard, to what degree? Chapter 3, verse 3, I think it is. In this, has this hope purifies himself just as he is pure. What hope? What hope is he talking about? Chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, he calls them beloved children. One day you will be just like him. And whoever has this hope purifies himself just as he is pure. You're not of this world. Therefore, when we get problems and issues and we get our eyes off of the Lord, problems result. We get chaos in our hearts. Our anger, we're frustrated. We don't know, why aren't you answering my prayer? Because you're not looking unto Jesus. And the minute that you and I start doing so, he starts going at work where? In your heart, in your mind, straightening you out before he straightens out everything around you. We just want him to straighten out everything around us. <laughs> but he has to straighten this out. Well, I've been serving the Lord for, oh, I don't care, put the, how many years in there? Six months or 60 years? Doesn't matter. He's going out to straighten out this heart. That's what he's after. I mean, why didn't, he, why didn't he come into my life when I was 25 instead of 34? Why didn't he come into my life and, and give me this, this holy anointing at five years old and I could be a child prodigy preacher? That's not what he had for me. He came into my life at 34 years old. And I had all that baggage. 34 years of baggage. Kara, why are you nodding? <laughs> Baggage, right? All kinds of baggage. Every, everything you could think of. Everything that you probably dealt with. I had housed inside this skin. Pounding me. Ears. Voices hounding me. Free. Catholicism. Bothering me. Hindering me. Free. How? Looking unto Jesus. Let the old man go. Let the new man come. And all it just I came to the altar, was prayed for, and it all it just happened. Immediately. <laughs> yeah. It's now been thirty-two years. Right? And we're seeing that pilgrims progress. More knowledge, more understanding, growing knowledge, understand. This is because of looking unto Jesus, looking for what he has for you. You have a new identity. Remember the teaching cross to conquer? The old identity and the identity issues, gone. I'm now new identity in Christ. New value system, yes? yes? Value is now found in the personhood of Jesus Christ. Not what mom says about me, not what dad thinks of me, not what my brothers and sisters think of me, not what my fellow man out there and business owner thinks of me. Oh man, he thinks I'm, I'm rude, I, I'm sorry. A, oh, I gotta go sure I make it right now. If I did wrong, go make it right. But if, if it's just for the sake of living in the kingdom, then that's a different story. You have a new value system and you have a new community. You are now belonging to his people. Therefore, if we betray his community, his value, and his identity, we bring shame on ourselves. We bring shame on him. We walk away. We go into a state of weakness. And then all of a sudden, it's not long before you and I are whining, pining, complaining, and explaining because of why is this going on in my life when I took my eyes off the ball, as they say. Yeah. Trying to teach the three kids down in Virginia, my three grandkids, about playing baseball. Olivia playing softball. And when they get up to bat, what's one thing they constantly hear from me and everyone else? Keep your eye on the ball. If it works for baseball, you, you get, if it works for baseball, I've seen like this. Rarely, rarely, rarely is a hit develop. And if they happen to hear, ding, they're running thinking they hit a home run when it really just has hit the backstop. <laughs> you must 
keep your eye, go bowling. Just throw it down. <laughs> Luke, you play tennis. Now just, just keep swinging. Just keep swinging. I'm sure it'll all work out. Just keep swinging. I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll learn. You'll do well. I'm sure when you're teaching Emma how to play tennis, that's what you did. Just go out there and start swinging your racket. <laughs> you know, I'm sure that'll work, right? If, it's, if it applied towards things of this, to keep your eyes on him. This is the answer. Three words that will save you and I a host of problems. Amen? Amen. Fight for him. Fight for his kingdom. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. Is that not what he said? Yes. For casting down arguments, pulling down arguments, casting down arguments, and all every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Yes? yes? And then he adds this part. And being ready to punish. What? Who am I to do that? I don't want to do that. That's offensive. And being ready to punish all disobedience once your obedience is fulfilled. Yes? Yes. Once your obedience is fulfilled, now you're ready to cast down that argument. Now you're ready to fight for the Lord. Yes? yes. Or, as you've heard me say in time past, capiche? <laughs> capiche, right? He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Turn to the faith, to the one who is faith. Faith is connected to a person. Hear me now. Faith is connected to a person. Faith is not just something you developed in your life, so I finally am developing faith. Faith is connected to a person. That personhood, the same faith of Jesus Christ coming alive in you. You fight for him. You fight for the kingdom. You live for the kingdom. You have the same faith. Faith is just like his faith. He's the author of it. You're not mustering up some coexist faith to just be polite and kind to everybody else. Coexist faith is devil's doctrine. But you are the one that recognizing that he is the author of it. He sparked this faith. Whose faith? His faith. What is his faith based on? Like, if I was to look and say, what is his faith based on? It's based on this one word. Nevertheless. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. Living for the will of God, living for the ways of God, living by the wisdom of God, doing all things according to the very heart, mind, and soul of God Almighty. And you learn of the faith as Hebrews 11 showed us and displayed and demonstrated. And we live looking unto Jesus, who's the author. He authored this. He, he's the source of it. He's the founder and the foundation of it. That's what we're looking for. And he's also the completer of it, the finisher. Philippians 1.6, he says, He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's a day to look forward to. Yes? yes. Put this in your heart. Mark it down as you've heard me say in time past during a sermon when I, when I talked to you about Thessalonians and I said to memorize the scripture, God is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. In this is another one, Philippians 1.6, He who has begun a good work in me will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. There's a day that is coming, the day when you'll meet him. And he's the one who authored this in your life by the Holy Spirit, giving you the Holy Spirit. The faith that he has housed in Christ is now in the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit being in you, the new creation in Christ. And that same faith has been birthed in you and now he's at work to complete it. So hence, hear me now, please hear me. Don't fight him. But surrender to him. That's where all these issues, internal issues and frustrations yield because, go away and they yield because you're surrendering. I surrender to the completing work of the Holy Spirit in me. You birth this in me. What am I doing fighting the Holy Spirit? What did the Holy Spirit, what did Christ say to Paul? Stop fighting against the goats. Stop kicking against. Stop fighting. Why, why are you persecuting the church? If you're fighting against the body of Christ, what are you doing? Same way, your flesh nature, your natural man, my natural man, I'm in this too. When I say you and when I say me, I mean always we and our. Yes? <laughs> I'm never excluded from this. This was first applied to me because I'm ready to punish all disobedience to the extent 
that my obedience has been fulfilled. So I can come against zealous and want to see and come forth because I want to see that new life come forth because I'm looking for the Holy Spirit to complete that good work in you and in me. How long is this battle going on? Well, it's either going to be the end of my days or till the day of Jesus Christ. One's coming first. But we continue. Get up in the next morning and you put your feet to the floor. Let's go. Get up in the middle of the night. Somebody should be on your mind. I was always amazed that when I came to know the Lord and I all of a sudden was getting up in the middle of the night or, and He was waking me up in the middle of the night. Who's on my mind? Jesus. Holy Spirit talking to him, middle of the night, making my way to the, to the, to the, you know, and uh, I'm talking to him. On the way back, talking to him. You're alive with, and he's completing this work, and he's completing in his work, as Colossians chapter 2 says, that he's there to circumcise your heart. To circumcise your heart. He's cutting away that old nature so that Christ in you comes alive, matures, and becomes into a state of completion. Don't let pride fight against the work of the Holy Spirit. Don't try to navigate and circumvent the things of the cross. Give in to Him. Surrender to the circumcising work of the Holy Spirit. He also says in Colossians chapter 2, don't let anyone cheat you. Don't let anybody deceive you and don't let anyone defraud you. He says it three times in chapter 2. Three times. I've preached a sermon on that in time past. Don't let anyone defraud you. Don't let anything deceive you. Don't let anyone cheat you. Don't let anything come, no philosophy of man, nothing come to steal away. Let him do his circumcising work because he is finishing, he is completing the faith. That faith that says yes and you see the Lord because we walk by faith, not by sight. And you're looking unto Jesus and he's the author of this faith, the nevertheless kind of faith. And he's the finisher. And he's bringing me home as he did. And he, and he raised up Christ from the dead. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the same Holy Spirit that will raise me from the dead. And the same glory as we saw in Colossians chapter 3, the same glory that God has when he is revealed we shall be revealed as the sons and daughters of God this excites me I get stirred but for the first 34 years of my life it didn't stir me so much I could hear this and hear that and people and Bible and and it was okay, and it was, I went to church, and I did my confession thing, and I did the, the whole Ash Wednesday thing in the confessional booth, and I saw the priest, and I was in there, and I did all those things. Church, Bible, truth, navigating my own way, aimless, directionless. But all of a sudden, 34 years old, October, 1989. Bing. Open. Truth, stirred, love, want to, go after, Jesus, looking unto, all the things that used to cause fret in me, dissipated, grow, tra grow strangely dim, lust that had me gripped, bound with inadequacy and insecurities, slowly springing me forth. What? Don't let anyone cheat you. Don't let anyone defraud you. Don't let anyone deceive you. Looking unto Jesus, stay focused, because the one who authored this at 34 years old is the one who will also finish it or complete it. What did he say on the cross, those three great words? It is finished. At the end of Revelation, what are the three great words? It is done. He's finishing that work in you where you and I will hear, it is done. He's d I'm done. Just like when turkey in the oven... Pie in the oven, choose your weapon. <laughs> right? I'll even do it with a pop tart and look for that, just that right crispness. You know, not too much, not too underdone, not too hot. Just right, push the button, it's, it's perfect <laughs> for a pop tart. It is done. Pop tart, pie, steak. Oh, it's a little too cooked. Oh, it's too little too undercooked. It is perfect. He's doing this work perfect. The perfect one is doing a perfect work to make you and I perfect in Him. Well, He knows we're weak and He knows we can't do it and He just loves us anyway. 
You won't find that in the gospel. You won't find that in the kingdom. And that's the one who will surely be left behind. You made excuses so you didn't have to obey. You were that unfaithful servant hiding it in your pocket. Here, we find that all this faith that was demonstrated in chapter 11, displayed, but not separate from Christ. All the faith that was displayed and demonstrated in chapter 11 was not separate from Christ. Well, that was their faith. Same Holy Spirit with them is the same Holy Spirit in us. Same Holy Spirit. They didn't have their own separate faith. They had faith in Christ. Remember, Moses struck that rock and that rock was Christ. The Holy Spirit was there all along in that desert. The holy, holy man of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Here we find that the faith that was in the Old Testament prophets and the great men and women of the Old Testament, and we say the Old Testament meaning before Christ came, was the forerunner all pointing to Jesus coming, and now he has come, and we are left without any, any excuse. He's not overlooking sin anymore. He's, not, he's looking for this. Hear him, as we said in our prior classes of Hebrews. He's calling for you to hear him. But you must have the Holy Spirit. You must have the faith that was in Christ Jesus to hear. And that old hymn, hear and obey. Because there's no other way. That's biblical. It's a hymn built on biblical principle of understanding doctrine. Statute upon statute. Hear him. Obey. And the more you know this Bible, the more you know his word, the more that you know of him, you obey. You yield to. Obey is yielding to. It's faith. You're obeying the faith. Unbashful, unashamed obedience, following after in Jesus' name. Amen?